the Health Institute. I work on alumni relations. And I just want to again say welcome to all of you who are also joining from outside of GBHI and UCSF. Um, this session is being recorded. This is part of the Global Neurology Forum Track 2 series session exploring core challenges in global neurology. The series is two years old and today's session is the first in 2021. Please feel free to share your ideas and comments in the chat. And also we just ask that you mute yourselves to avoid any background noise. I'd like to express my thanks to my colleagues, Kira Power and Winnie Sout who are assisting in the background. And I'm just going to advance the slide. Okay. So one thing we just like to remind everybody is that these presentations are provided for educational purposes only. The forum is not designed to provide advice on care of patients, which remains solely the responsibility of the physicians in the country. And as mentioned, um, this session is going to be recorded, is being recorded, and it will be posted afterwards for educational purposes. Um, I'd now like to pass the baton to my colleague, Dr. John Van Lewin, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives with UCSF Weill Institute for Neurosciences. He is an assistant professor of neurology and he is a faculty member with the Global Brain Health Institute. John and his colleague, Dr. Riley Beauvais, co-lead this track number two of the series. Over to you, John. Thank you, Camelia. And thank you all for being here, especially those of of you that uh, are taking time on your Friday night to, to uh, spend time with us. So as Camila mentioned, I'm John Von Lewin. I'm part of the faculty at UCSF and also GBHI. Uh, along with my fellow neurology colleague, Dr. Riley Beauvais, uh, we are the co-directors of the Global Teleneurology Service and will be your moderators today. So I'll give you a brief overview of our agenda and share some opening comments before we get to the main part of our discussion today. So on the next slide, you'll see that uh, the focus will be on neurological complications, uh, neurological manifestations of COVID-19. And Dr. Michael Wilson will walk us through uh, what's currently known and some things to look forward to. Uh, and then we'll hear from diverse perspectives from our panelists, uh, bring perspectives from Egypt, Zambia, Malawi. And then we'll close the session with a Q&A. We'll have a chance for the audience to ask questions and engage with, with a group of speakers. Uh, and so before we jump into the main part of the session, though, I just wanted to, with it being a year that we've now all been living with and dealing with the pandemic, just to zoom out a little bit and provide some context and an opportunity for us to reflect on the past year. So where were we a year ago? Uh, it's been just a little over a year, March 11th, when the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a pandemic. Uh, on today, March 19th, if you, you'll see next, that uh, for those of us in California, this is when the state issued a, a, a lockdown stay at home orders. There were a handful of other countries that on the same day uh, also issued lockdown orders, including Argentina, Morocco, Portugal, and others. By the end of the month, end of March, the, there were about, my rough count, around 85 countries that had issued lockdown orders. So next, uh, we can see that COVID-19 has truly been a global challenge, but we've also seen that the impact has been uneven. Within countries, some groups have suffered more. Uh, here in the US, oftentimes, historically marginalized groups have suffered more. Across countries and different regions, we've seen variability as well and sometimes not always in the ways that we expected. Uh, you can see data here suggests differences in the number of cases that we've seen uh, in different regions. And on the next are a couple of example countries. But there's also the question of, do these data reflect what's actually happening on the ground? Or might they also be indicative of disparities in testing? Uh, are there limited resources and infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, that, uh, it's not able to happen at the same scale, and so cases go undetected. We can return to this question uh, with our panel. <clears throat> so we also see in a similar story with, with deaths. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll see that in the same regions, places... 
And just a reminder for those just joining, if, if you could please uh, mute yourselves. Uh, so we see regions that had showed the most cases by the same data, similar data, also seem to show uh, a higher impact of deaths in different regions. And then next you'll see, again, the same example countries. And again, as raises the question of, <clears throat> are these real differences that we see? You know, are there population differences, difference in responses by different countries, or uh, are there capacity issues where uh, the cases are being, and deaths are being undercounted? So is it real disparities or some combination? The, if you go to the next, you'll see that one area where we know that there are disparities is in vaccine access. Uh, this is a map by the uh, economist showing when it's anticipated that different countries will have wide access to vaccines. Uh, so despite, and so as there's broad rollout happening in the US and the EU, we know that there are many, much of the world's population face a very different outlook. We also know from the last year that uh, these are global challenges though, that uh, a novel vi virus or variant in one part of the world can upend life in another part of the world. And so next, the as we continue to think about how to contend with the global challenges of COVID-19, uh, it's also an opportunity for shared learning. Uh, one of the, the narratives that hasn't been, we haven't heard loudly enough, at least not here in the US, is uh, what we can learn from other countries. I don't think there's any one country we can point to that got the pandemic right. And instead, we realize that there's shared challenges that we all have with this, this challenge, and there's opportunities for shared learning. And so we come to the discussion today knowing that we have shared challenges and appreciating that we can learn from different perspectives. So with that context, I'd like to zoom back in, no pun intended, uh, today's session about uh, the neurological complications of COVID-19. Uh, and I'll introduce our, our panelists in just a bit, but first I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Wilson. Dr. Wilson is an associate prep professor in the Department of Neurology at UCSF. He is a neurologist specializing in infectious and autoimmune diseases of the central nervous system, and he has a robust research program uh, leading in developing new technologies that enhance our understanding of the causes of autoimmune and infectious CNS diseases. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Michael. Great, thanks so much to, to John Eric and, and Riley Beauvais for the invitation. And um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. So, um, so I've been tasked with, uh, you know, trying to just give a, a brief overview of, you know, what what we're seeing in terms of the neurological manifestations of COVID nineteen, and I'll I, um, touch on some of the the work that we've been doing in the lab to to try and um, increase our understanding as well. Um, in terms of disclosures, um, nothing really uh, relevant to to this talk today. Um, so, so of course, the the main manifestations of, of COVID nineteen are are uh, systemic, um, particular uh, uh, cardiopulmonary complications of the viral pneumonia. Um, but it was noticed uh, early on. There was, I think, the initial paper was published in JAMA Neurology um, in the uh, uh, spring. Um, from China suggesting that about a third of patients with COVID-19 had some uh, detectable uh, neurologic complication, whether it was uh, encephalopathy, like a confusion, difficulty waking up, um, or peripheral uh, nerve symptoms. Um, and since then, that, that literature has been growing um, by leaps and bounds. Um, and, and this is, you know, kind of, you know, a, a thumbnail of kind of what what different types of complications have been seen, uh, mostly in the brain, but to some degree in the peripheral nervous system. So, uh, loss of taste and smell um, has been, you know, kind of a, a, a defining early symptom for many patients, um, even even patients for whom the uh, uh, respiratory symptoms are mild or absent. Um, headaches are common. Myalgias, muscle pains, seizures rarely. Uh, there's been a whole literature developing on potential increased uh, stroke risk in patients, and that you know that um, likely uh, reflects kind of the increased risk of clotting that that many COVID patients have. Um, and then uh, you know 
syndromes that, that we're, we get excited about in the lab is patients with more kind of diffuse central nervous system dysfunction. And we go back and forth about whether we call, call it an encephalopathy or an encephalitis. Is there actually frank inflammation in the brain? And we'll talk about that. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome has been reported, so a peripheral demyelinating disease, as well as rare cases of, of uh, inflammation in the spinal cord and, and again, in the, in the brain. Um, and I think like many um, infections that primarily cause systemic disease, it's um, when you try to parse out when uh, the cause of a patient's uh, neurologic symptoms, it can be quite murky and quite uh, difficult uh, because system, you know, the brain is, of course, entirely dependent on the proper functioning of the rest of the body. And so if patients have low oxygen levels because their lungs aren't working properly, if their blood pressure is, is up or down, if their kidneys and or liver are not working properly, then those, those uh, multi-organ system problems are more than sufficient to cause a, a huge variety of neurologic complications. And so I think we have to be careful uh, as neurologists to overinterpret, um, uh, you know, neurologic complications in COVID patients, and and remember that you know a good proportion of these uh, complications are likely due to those uh, systemic effects and not due to kind of a primary uh, injury to the to the brain. Um, but there are cases in which. Um, you know, brain imaging and kind of the clinical history really do suggest that um, there may be uh, instances where the, the virus itself may get into the brain or um, that uh, there may be a para-infectious cause of, of brain dysfunction, meaning that there may be an immune response to the virus that has spillover effects on the brain. And the way that um, that we start to try and identify those cases is, of course, to look for viral RNA um, in the spinal fluid. Um, and that, in, in the case of COVID-19, finding SARS-CoV-2 RNA has been very difficult. Um, so there's there are very few cases where, where that's been documented. Um, and, and then in the post-mortem studies, looking at uh, brain tissues from patients, um, there's they're, they're conflicting reports, but in general, the consensus seems to be that the detection of the virus in the brain is, is, is limited. Um, another thing that we, we look at though, is um, when we try to diagnose a neuroinvasive virus is, is uh, looking at antibodies to that virus in the central nervous system, in the, in the spinal fluid. Um, and we do that for not just uh, in COVID, but um, for a, a number of neuroinvasive uh, infections, this is just a, you know, a, a incomplete list. So things like West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, measles virus, it's always, the gold standard is always to detect the virus itself, but we recognize that many viruses, um, when they uh, get into the brain, they may only be present in the, in the brain for hours to days, even though the patient may be then sick for you know, days to weeks to months thereafter. And so um, not detecting the virus doesn't mean that it was never there, especially for COVID patients um, for whom the bar to doing an early spinal tap is very high. And so I think many of these patients, if they do get a spinal tap, it's late in their hospitalization. And, and it may be um, just that the virus, if it was in the central nervous system is long gone by the time, by the time we, we look for it. And so um, we've done a lot of work uh, on, in addition to kind of detecting, uh, directly detecting uh, viruses and other pathogens with deep sequencing, we've done a lot of work also to um, come up with ways to sensitively profile the antiviral antibodies um, in spinal fluid to help um, uh, identify causes of different uh, neurologic syndromes. And, and the way we do this without getting too much in detail is that, um, you know, a traditional antibody test is, you know, a sing there's a single test for, for a single virus. Um, and, uh, but we've taken a broader approach um, where we um, make what's called a bacteriophage library. So these kind of lunar lander type viruses, and we engineer them to express 
one of about 500,000 pieces of different viral proteins. So kind of all vertebrate viruses, all tick viruses and, and uh, mosquito viruses. And um, so together, those, those viruses will express small pieces of all these different viruses, uh, proteins. And we incubate those viruses that are harmless with antibodies from a patient sample. And we let those antibodies pull out um, any peptides that they bind to. And we wash away any of these phage or viruses that didn't find an antibody partner. And then we just sequence the DNA of the phage that were pulled out by the patient antibodies. And that gives us a profile of what um, viral antigens are being bound in the, in the spinal fluid. And so one kind of proof of principle that we worked on was a condition uh, called acute uh, uh, flaccid myelitis, um, which is a polio-like illness um, that's been spiking every other year um, in the US and other countries. And um, it was, again, a syndrome in which it was very difficult to detect viral RNA in the spinal fluid. Um, and so working with a number of groups, um, we profiled spinal fluid from about 40 children with this condition and compared it to the antibody profiles in spinal fluid of children um, with other neuroinflammatory diseases. And the only viral family and genus that was um, that it had antibodies that were overrepresented in those children, uh, those children's uh, CSF were enterovirus. Um, and that fit with kind of the epidemiologic and, and the available direct detection data to support that probably it's a non-polio enterovirus like D68 or A71 that's uh, responsible for a large number of these cases. And that, that work was really um, spearheaded, whoops, sorry. That work was really spearheaded by uh, Ryan Schubert, Isabel Hawes, and, and Akshaya Ramesh. And so when the pandemic started, um, really talented uh, bioengineer, Colin Zemechnik, and uh, infectious disease doctor working with uh, my mentor, Joe Derisi, and Jayan Rajan, um, designed a phage library to profile really densely the antibodies that patients develop against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And um, so this was called coronaphage. And um, this was an, just an initial proof of principle uh, publication, just showing across kind of all the different proteins in the SARS-CoV-2 proteome, where the hotspots are that antibodies bind um, uh, in, in, in the blood of infected patients. And uh, Colin, as an engineer, then was able, I won't go into the details here, but was able to isolate the, the peptides displayed by phage that were the most immunogenic and kind of turn that into a multiplex serology assay. And this, again, this is just to gloss over, but the, this kind of multiplex assay allows us to detect um, multiple uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, um, both sensitively and specifically to really identify confidently patients who have been exposed um, to that virus. And so with this multiplex tool, um, we have started to profile spinal fluid um, from patients with uh, neurologic complications of COVID-19. And again, these are folks who um, have a variety of different uh, symptoms ranging from uh, um, persistent headaches to difficulty waking up after being extubated um, to seizures. Um, and none of these patients had viral RNA uh, detected in their spinal fluid, um, but virtually all of them had uh, very clear um, uh, antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in their CSF. And the profiles in the CSF sometimes, but not always differed between the antibody profiles in their blood, suggesting that there may be more of a compartmentalized immune response uh, in these patients. So that was a first piece of, of data. Um, and now I'll, this is more provocative and, and um, I, we don't know what it means yet, um, but we, we also do a lot of uh, work in the lab to find autoantibodies in patients with unusual neurologic syndromes. And because we have these tools available, we said, let's you know, take a look at you know, what we find when we, we take COVID-19 patient CSF and look for autoantibodies. Um, we know that 
you know, there have been systemic uh, syndromes, especially in children, um, the uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome like Kawasaki's disease in, in kids, um, rare kids who get COVID-19. And so thought it was worth taking a look uh, in, in CSF as well. So we have a companion phage library that expresses uh, instead of pieces of viral proteins expresses pieces of all human proteins. And so we can, we've used that in the past to identify new perineoplastic diseases. So autoimmune disorders triggered by tumors. Um, and uh, we, we've used these tools again to start looking at spinal fluid from COVID patients. So this is work that's really been led by uh, Sam Pleasure, Chris Bartley, Thomas Ngo and uh, Ravi Dandekar. And um, the, as a first pass, we take spinal fluid from patients uh, and expose it to uh, mouse brain tissue. And we um, incubate that tissue with the spinal fluid. And the, the idea is that if, there's, if there are antibodies present in the spinal fluid that are able to bind to a brain protein, um, these antibodies, we can, we can detect them with a, a fluorescent secondary uh, antibody. And so these are just some, some, I think, beautiful images from different patients' spinal fluid showing in green um, uh, cells that are, are being bound by, uh, again, spinal fluid from these patients. And um, you can see, oops, in the first case, the Purkinje neurons and the cerebellum beautifully lighting up, multiple layers of the cortex. And again, in another patient, um, diffuse staining throughout uh, multiple regions of the hippocampus. Um, in this patient, uh, just a focal area, the CA3 region in the hippocampus uh, lighting up, um, and then specific layers of the cortex in another patient, and, and as well as the thalamus. So we see the staining. Um, it's different across patients. Again, these patients have different clinical syndromes. Um, and then using the antibody discovery tools, Chris has been uh, working with Bonnie and, and Ravi um, to identify exactly what proteins um, are being bound. And this is just early work um, that should be out soon in which um, a couple of different uh, brain proteins have been identified. Uh, again, we don't know what this means yet because the syndrome, the individual cases are quite uh, varied and, and we have small numbers, but I think it's, it's provocative to think about, you know, whether, whether there could be a para-infectious component um, to what the neurologic complications that we're seeing in these patients. The last piece of kind of provocative data I'll show is that, um, you know, the, many of these patients we worked on with colleagues at Yale, um, and they did something, a different technique where they sequenced individual cells from the spinal fluid of these patients and, and including B cells. And so they were able to recover the immunoglobulin, the antibody sequences from these B cells. And using those, we were able to make, re recreate the antibody, individual antibodies that these cells were making and then do the same thing to see whether they stain brain tissue and also to see whether they um, bound to any of the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And this, this monoclonal antibody in particular, uh, number two, um, clearly has brain staining. We don't know exactly what the protein is yet, but it also was a very strong binder of the SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein. So at least in this one patient for this one antibody, there's some um, pretty clear suggestion of cross-reactivity that one antibody can both bind a region of the, the virus, but also um, can bind, bind a brain protein. So again, this, these are just some early uh, clues about what, what may be going on in some of these patients, um, but we still have small numbers. We don't have a unifying neurologic syndrome across these small numbers of patients. And interestingly, you know, many of these patients who do get spinal taps, kind of the classic markers of inflammation, like an increased number of cells, oligoclonal bands, so the, the presence of um, unique antibody species in the spinal fluid um, are not that common. They do occur in some patients, but in some of these patients with the clear brain slice staining, um, those markers were largely absent. Um, so I think it, it, that, that was a, a large surprise to me. 
And you know, the, the question will be going forward is do do any of these findings have therapeutic implications? I mean, we just we just don't know yet. Um, so I'll I'll I know we're want to open it up um, for the panel discussion, but suffice it to say, this was a lot of collaborative work, and and I want to thank thank a lot of people. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Michael, for that very informative overview and uh, look into some of the exciting work that's happening and how we can better understand this perplexing disease. So maybe I'll bring in our panelists to see if they have any initial comments, and I'll. I'll introduce you to our panelists in just a minute, but want to see if they have any initial comments uh, or questions for, for Michael. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for your very informative presentation. Uh, I, I personally learned a lot out of it. Um, I guess we see the same complications here in Egypt um, as regards the, the anosmia and the uh, headaches and myalgias and the other symptoms. Uh, we've also seen a lot of uh, thrombo, thrombo, um, thromboembolic events and Guillain-Barre syndromes and even uh, isolated nerve injuries like facial nerve and axillary and peripheral nerves. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, it was, it's very interest, uh, interesting to hear about the um, coronaphage virus scan method and the uh, monoclonal antibody technique. And I was wondering when are the spinal taps taken? Is it uh, during the acute illness phase or a few weeks after the resolution of the toxemia at least? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a bit all over the map. Um, you know, I think we, we're, we're, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's, you know, you'd think given, you know, in the US, just the sheer magnitude of the number of people who have been infected that, you know, spinal fluid would be, you know, somewhat easy to come by, but it's not, <laughs> you know, many of the, I think because of, you know, limitations and like protective equipment and, and the fact that these patients have many other, you know, systemic uh, symptoms, you know, doing a spinal tap is pretty low on the list, especially if there's not kind of a, a clear kind of change in management that it's necessarily going to result in. And so, um, so we've looked at, you know, a lot of the Yale samples were um, uh, obtained relatively acutely. They were during the hospitalization, but they might have been a week or two weeks in um, to the hospitalization. But we're starting to look um, uh, more and more at kind of some of the long hauler patients with who are now outpatients who are getting um, uh, you know more chronic. You know, maybe weeks or months out from their uh, you know, acute illness and, and looking at those as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for that um, wonderful presentation. I, I did indeed uh, learn a lot as well. Um, this work, I think, is extremely important given all we are starting to learn about neurological manifestations. From a neurologist's uh, and neurological point of view, um, it's always unclear, as you stated, Michael, whether what we are seeing as a manifestation is a result of the COVID uh, infection or an underlying um, or multi-systemic effect. Um, the, the work that you're doing, I think, would be very important and will go a long way in helping us uh, start to start to understand. And I thought, um, I was curious on your comments, what would be your um, uh, I know you had a small sample, and I know you're feeling um, this is a, a preliminary finding. But what would you think would be the biggest association with the CSF finding with regards to a, a neurological symptom? Would you I, think uh, patients with encephalitis, patients with encephalopathy, um, what was the strongest um, association? And what kind of um, uh, strains did you think you looked at? And we have plans maybe to look at other variants that are coming up. Do you think they show um, a similar trend or any differences in, in variation? Yeah, I I think you know to I I've been very surprised by the high rel, even though we've looked maybe I would say at 20 to 30 cases now, I've been quite surprised at the frequency with which we're um, detecting, you know, candidate 
autoantibodies. Um, I wouldn't have predicted that. I think, and I think if we didn't have the tools kind of ready to go in the lab, I, I, I don't know if I would have pushed hard to develop them to, to look. Um, I much more, you know, would have uh, supposed that it was, it was due to the virus directly or due to the systemic complications, as you say. Um, again, I, so I think, I think the data, I'm confident in the data. I still, but I, but I, what I'm still not confident in is the, the link to kind of the clinical syndrome. I think, you know, one case I did, but I think, you know, hopefully over, you know, the coming weeks and months that at least some of these cases will become clearer. Um, you know, we, there's a, a, a uh, individual case I didn't present here, um, but the, another, an outpatient case that we worked on with the Yale folks in which um, there was a, uh, a man in his 30s who had no psychiatric history, who developed COVID, was diagnosed, and then the next, but, but never became, you know, systemically very ill, was never hospitalized. But the day after the um, PCR test came back positive, he developed very paranoid delusions. He um, thought that the rapture was coming um, and uh, got violent with his mother, was locking himself in his room. And he was um, put in a psychiatric facility um, for a number of weeks and was very refractory to uh, antipsychotics um, and eventually was transferred to a medical ward where he got a spinal tap and um, uh, had largely you know, normal spinal fluid profile, but had very uh, prominent uh, brain slice staining and uh, was treated with IVIG and within a week was back, kind of snapped out of it basically. After 35 days of um, being psychotic, he, he was back at work within a week. Um, so that, in, I think that to me is kind of a a case where I'm, I'm much more convinced that um, there may have been a parainfectious syndrome. I think for some of these cases where, again, where people are so um, systemically unwell and where the spinal fluid is normal and brain MRI is normal, it's, it, that gets a, a lot harder to, to say. But I think, you know, following these patients over time may, you know, may help sort that out as well. So, sorry, I didn't, I, I'm hedging a little bit, but <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I know this is a, a very important and which is a sometimes a bit difficult uh, subject to, to um, precisely describe. So thank you for your work. This is very interesting. Luange, did you have uh, any comments for now or should we uh, move to uh, the other remark? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael, for the wonderful presentation. And we've really learned a lot. And uh, thanks and congratulations for the wonderful work you've done. Uh, just some few comments, and maybe you might pitch in with uh, more information. Uh, from the presentation, I think I've learned a few interesting things that uh, uh, as much as antibodies were found uh, within the CSF, there was no evidence of uh, viral particles. Uh, that were noted uh, in the CSF. I don't know if you have uh, any explanation uh, uh, to that. I know you've uh, said that um, this might have suggested that this was some sort of uh, compartmentalized immune response. Do you think it might have an uh, effect in the management of patients with neurological complications or, or not? Yeah, it's a great point. I think, yeah, the it's definitely the gold standard, as you say, is definitely to detect the virus itself, um, either by culturing or by detecting its genetic material. Um, and, you know, finding antibodies in the spinal fluid is it's, it's significant, but, you know, it's not the same level of evidence as detecting the virus itself. It's certainly possible in some of these patients that some of that, you know, antibody may have, um, may have come from the systemic circulation. I think, you know, again, where we can, the fact that we can, um, uh, you know, more in a more detailed way profile exactly what, what antibodies are present, their specificities, the fact that in some of the patients there are differences in, in the spinal fluid versus the blood makes me more confident that, that these antibodies actually have an origin in, in the CNS and, and aren't just kind of spilling over from the blood, but that's, it's hard to, to, 
to be specific about that. Um, and in terms of you know treatment, you know I think um, that that's where I think the if if we get more confident that these autoantibodies might have a clinical relevance, then that could, could would have a more obvious treatment implication because we can do things about uh, autoimmune conditions. Um, but I think you know in terms of if it if it's purely virally mediated, then um, you know we we have limited kind of antiviral treatments for for COVID. And um, I think if, if you're not detecting the viral RNA and you're just seeing kind of an immune response to a prior viral infection, I'm, I'm not sure that there would be a big role for, you know, antivirals to, to treat um, that set of findings in, in, in a patient with neurologic complications. Thank you, Michael. Question. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you for, for the comments. I'll maybe I'll uh, shift over and provide an introduction to our, our panelists. And I see there's also some good questions in the chat, but we can return to those uh, in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, but now I'd like to introduce our panelists we're, that we're delighted to have uh, three panelists today. First is Dr. Aya Ashour, who is a consultant neurologist at uh, Ain Shams University Hospital in Cairo, Egypt. She's also a lecturer in the neurology and psychiatry departments and an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health. Uh, second, we have Dr. Mashina Champa, a neurologist at the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia. And there's a new training program recently established in Zambia, and Dr. Chamba has the distinction of being Zambian neurologist trained in Zambia. Uh, third, we have Dr. Tawange Firi, a consultant neurologist at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Malawi. And in a country of over 18 million people, Dr. Fury has the distinction of being the first adult neurologist in Malawi. So we are delighted to have all three of you with us today. Uh, and it would be great to, maybe if you could say a few words about yourselves and uh, share with us uh, some of your experiences, other comments you might have. And maybe uh, Dr. Fury, would you like to begin? Thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, I'm very delighted to be uh, in this uh, panel this evening and for the wonderful presentation. So I am uh, Tuonge, I'm an adult neurologist here in Malawi, and as already introduced, I am the first adult neurologist. And uh, that's good, but at the same time, it can also be uh, challenging in a population of 18 million people. So uh, in terms of uh, what I would like to share about uh, my experience with uh, COVID-19 in my country is that um, at the moment we've had a, over 32,000 uh, uh, confirmed infections of COVID-19 with uh, over 27,000 recoveries and uh, just over 1,000 uh, deaths. And uh, in terms of the uh, demographics of the patients that we are seeing, they are more similar to what uh, our colleagues in the West are seeing. It's mostly elderly people, and it's also mostly people with comorbidities that we tend to see in our work. And uh, briefly, I would like to talk about the challenges that uh, we are experiencing in terms of uh, neurological cases and uh, COVID-19. So the first thing is that um, due to problems with uh, screening and diagnosis, uh, we are unable to reach many patients. So as such, we feel that uh, the numbers that we are seeing are underrepresented. And uh, as such, we might not be able to see as many neurological cases as we would anticipate. So that's one of the problems. And the other problem is that uh, there's a lot of stigma associated with COVID-19 in my country. So you find that uh, most people, when they're sick, they'd rather not come to the hospital. They'd rather seek other forms of, uh, uh, of treatment because they're afraid of being diagnosed with COVID-19 and then their families are be stigmatized. That's also limiting the number of people we are seeing and might have an impact of the neurological cases that we might see. And uh, the other challenge we are seeing is in as much as we are seeing also neurological cases, some of the neurological cases that have been reported uh, are problems with taste, smell, myalgias, headaches, encephalopathies. Uh, we've 
instances of GBS and uh, strokes are quite common. Uh, and we also saw a case of transverse myelitis. The problem that we have with those is that when they are in the COVID ward or once you suspect the diagnosis, it's very difficult to investigate this patient because in a resource limited setting where you have only got one CT scan, you are protective of the rest of the population. So you find that patients with COVID-19 who have got neurological problems, sometimes they're not investigated because uh, how are you going to investigate them? Because you don't want to contaminate the rest of the population. And sometimes we tend to wait until they test negative, then further investigations can be done. So maybe only lab tests are the ones that are done. And that might have an impact in terms of care for these patients. And the other thing is that we have limited staff. So we have limited number of clinicians, limited number of physicians, and then, uh, as well as myself, I'm only found in one place. So it's very difficult sometimes to uh, pitch in into the management of these patients. So we are facing a pandemic and we are having the cases, but sometimes managing them, following them up and investigating them is a problem. That's what I really wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tawange. Uh, Mashina, would you like to share your experiences next? Yes, thanks, John, and um, thank you to Wonge um, for the work that you're doing in Malawi. And I, my name is Mashina Chomba. I uh, work in Osaka, which is the capital city of Zambia in uh, the southern part of Africa. Um, to Wonge's country, Malawi, and I, uh, my country, a neighboring country, so our challenges are quite similar. Um, and I will touch on a few issues that will probably similar to Wonga's experience um, and give uh, a few points from our experience as uh, the neurology unit at the hospital in the capital city of Osaka. Um, we all know that it's been about a year in most countries since we uh, recorded our first case and so March is, uh, marks exactly a year for us in Zambia. We are a population of about 17 million and officially we have uh, recorded 86,000 cases in this last year. Uh, with about a thousand uh, deaths. Um, and these um, uh, have over the last year been distributed through two major surges that we've experienced right around the middle of uh, 2020 and uh, towards the end of, the, of 2020. Right into the beginning of this year, we had our second surge uh, of cases. As Tionga has probably uh, touched on, we are, we are experiencing um, what I guess in many places have been described as the African paradox, uh, trying to understand what is uh, driving the cases, the actual number on the ground. We have some limitations in surveillance and testing, and so there's been a lot of questions about the true picture of uh, COVID-19 in Africa. So we have a few studies that have tried to come out now. Um, we had a post-mortem study that came out from Osaka here in Zambia that showed um, post-mortem swabs performed on uh, people who had uh, presented to the mortuary. Um, and it was found that there was a disproportionate number of COVID-19 uh, positive deaths from the community that were recorded at facilities. Uh, this was probably um, representative of what's happening throughout the country. And this shows that we are likely underestimating our cases here. Um, and it's a real point at what the challenges of testing and surveillance in this region. Um, there is also a number of uh, seroprevalence tests that have been done in different districts, um, showing about 92 times higher cases in the recent testing that have been recorded in the official uh, data that was there. Uh, the actual factors that are um, uh, leading to this discrepancy are yet to be understood, but one can assume this is due to uh, underlying challenges, uh, as Wonga mentioned, was getting the actual cases and the true picture in the community. So having um, given that background, we have now started facing this new uh, variant from um, our region here in Southern Africa, which uh, we, we experienced this last um, year, uh, as well as the beginning of this year, associated with a lot of, uh, a lot more cases, a lot more uh, spread of cases and high uh, mortality with a lot of severe cases than we saw the year before. Um, these um, challenges are yet um, are important, especially when we consider 
um, the ongoing vaccination programs that are yet even be rolled out in many countries in Africa. Um, on this background, we are seeing a lot of patients in our hospitals and rural communities that present with severe disease, either related to COVID or a, a severe neurological uh, um, presentation to the hospital. Our experience has been that a lot of cases are um, largely unrecognized as COVID-19 related. So we have patients on our ward with neurological problems who don't yet get a test um, and get a COVID test in, in a few days after the admission, uh, managing our general ward and then test positive for COVID. It's hard, as I as I was discussing and as Michael mentioned, it's hard to tell if this is a, a coexisting uh, infection or if this is uh, a neurological problem that was caused by the COVID. But that creates a, a unique problem in, with regards to exposure. With limited PPE outside the isolation ward, the patients that we are managing in our general ward that get a COVID test late due to the constraints of test kits in our hospital are often leading to exposure to the COVID as we manage these cases before they are identified. Uh, once they're identified as COVID-19 cases, we are having trouble within the isolation ward of long duration to get them tested adequately for the neurological problem they have. We have limited CT scan and MRI and getting them out of the isolation ward to get tested is a bit of a challenge. So these are, this is an overall picture of what we are facing. Uh, if I was to share a few cases as well, what, we, what we've seen over the last year without any um, systematic recording of cases, but from our experience as a unit, we have had a, a large number of cases um, presenting with venous sinus thrombosis. A lot more cases of that has been experienced over the last year than we experienced before. Uh, in young people uh, with very unclear uh, or an obvious uh, underlying risk factors. We have had a few cases of uh, seizures in uh, the setting of COVID-19. Stroke cases are quite common in young people here, even before COVID, but we're seeing uh, that as an ongoing problem throughout this pandemic. Um, we've had a few cases of worsening underlying neurological conditions with patients in the scan showing tumors, um, particularly in young people. And of course, that likely was an underlying uh, problem from the radiological features. Uh, going forward, I think um, platforms like this are very helpful um, with regards to learning um, and getting the networking that could allow us to um, experience and then ex experience it from other countries. Um, hopefully, with um, some of the collaborations we are doing with the Ministry of Health and uh, international collaborators, we we might get um, some idea of how to systematically follow up these patients. And as the science comes out from the work like Michael's doing, uh, it will definitely help um, with um, understanding this problem a little bit better. So I'll end here for now. I'm very happy to have been invited to the for this opportunity. Thank you, Majina, for, for that overview, sharing those comments. Uh, Aya, would you like to share your comments from experiences from Egypt? Sure. Thank you very much, John, for the uh, presentation, uh, for the introduction. And um, I'm really uh, uh, flattered to be part of this forum and to be co-panelist with uh, uh, Tiyonga and Mashina, being pioneers of neurology in their countries. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, the uh, neurological complications we see is almost the, the same as uh, seen everywhere. Uh, mentioned like like mentioned in the presentation of Michael. Um, we are a population of 100 million and we have up till now 200,000 uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19, um, which most probably are not the only cases because uh, we do have uh, a, pro, um, a number of non-confirmed cases because uh, the affordability to get the PCR testing um, it's really it's relatively expensive, and you that you don't get routinely tested. Uh, the maybe the main challenges we face is that the access to a neurologist differs from the urban to rural areas. Um, I I'm a general neurologist in a tertiary center, a university hospital in Cairo. So we get to see a lot of COVID nineteen patients, and my hospital is already a COVID-19 uh, dedicated uh, hospital since the, the early days of the pandemic. 
So we get to see a lot of neurological complications. But others in other governorates government or citizens in Egypt uh, sure have uh, a small number uh, of neurologists or access to neurology, uh, neurology services. And for sure, many cases are missed. Um, the other thing is that many patients fear to visit the hospital uh, for fear to uh, catch an infection and for fear of stigma. It's something like uh, I've got the plague. <laughs> Uh, so they are not happy to, to show the symptoms. And um, the, well, the positive side is that we do have a strong parallel health system. Uh, we have uh, a number of NGOs of non-governmental uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, networks of doctors who can help uh, patients um, in a, uh, a non-hospital setting. Uh, a lot of volunteers who can give their, their time and their effort to uh, to manage patients outside of the hospitals and to give uh, hospital uh, um, home visits, even without uh, being paid. We also have a, um, a successful uh, 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 telemedicine service um, in many of our um, big centers or university hospitals. Mine is one of them. And we already connected to some of the remote centers in the other cities of Egypt and that that's increases uh, the accessibility to at least uh, get, get diagnosed with a neurological uh, sequelae of COVID-19. Um, we still have, of course, the, the, the hot topic now is the vaccine and the um, availability of the vaccines and the type of vaccine given. Uh, I'm not sure what, what is it in, uh, um, in uh, Zambia and Malawi, but we are getting um, a number of different vaccines according to um, to to the to the age of the recipient and the, his occupation, his or her occupation. So it's um, a little um, it carries a lot of the conspiracy theory thing. Like why are they getting this vaccine and why are the others getting the other vaccine? And so it, it creates a lot of uh, hassle here. We still don't know what <laughs> what are we going to. Uh, to see as, as complications from the vaccine and uh, or not, I hope. Um, so yeah, that, that's I think the, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, there are still a lot of, of um, neurological complications to be uh, studied uh, out of COVID vaccine. It's relatively new. One year is, is, is a, it's still a very young vaccine. So uh, we are um, looking into more um, complications to see as regards cognitive affection as 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 you mentioned uh the uh, neuropsychiatric um, uh, complications and the the indirect cognitive effects is it due to depression or is it like a, a normal complication after or a common complication after the infection we're still into it so that's the, like a brief uh of what our we're going through in egypt during the pandemic and thank you very much Thank you, Aya. Uh, and I think we want to get to questions. So maybe I'll bring in Riley first to see if you kick off questions for us, and then we'll get to questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you so much to our speakers and uh, panelists. Um, I think to really sort of piggyback on what you were just saying, Aya, um, uh, a lot of our GBHI um, uh, um, alumni are really interested in sort of the real world implications of the neurological conditions. and just uh, we're wondering what each of the panelists is seeing in terms of um, the real world impact of the cognitive sequelae. Are, are, are you seeing decreased work productivity? Um, are you seeing sort of uh, sort of disparities in that in that recuperation period? Um, how can we understand sort of that long term impact on 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 people's functioning in their daily lives? Uh, if, if I go first, um, we, we've heard a lot of or a few of um, subjective memory complaints after COVID. And um, when you, it's, it's, it's difficult to say if the productivity is decreased because the overall productivity throughout the, the past year is, is different. It's not, it's not decreased, but it is different. So it, it's hard to say whether it's due to post COVID or it, this is the usual uh, slow. Uh, um, pace of productivity, if you know what I mean. 
but for sure we've got um i've heard from patients and from 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 neuro pre-existing neurological patients or patients with neurological disorders and from uh, pre-covid um, healthy persons that uh, they do suffer from some memory complaints yeah i i would echo that um as well from i have um i don't think this has been investigated uh, again systematically in our country but from the patients i've seen um so there's two kinds of patients there'll be those with really severe illness that were hospitalized they may have some uh physical sequelae from the actual um experience with the infection um or if they have any neurological you know, infections then there's patients who had covid uh without um they have hospitalization and uh, get um a follow-up for some other reason i have seen um in young people uh, who are relatively healthy without any um risk factors from the uh, prior history who have a lot of anxiety i think anxiety is one of the um, um large presentations i'm seeing in the clinic uh, patients return to us because they have um they feel like um it's a lot of uh, association with what's happening around them. They don't feel they're in control, there's a lot of anxiety. That, that tends to really affect their work. So I have a few patients who are following up for that. Um, we're investigating them for um, any physical um, manifestations of the, of the disease, but there's a, a huge component of anxiety as well. Mental health is a big issue with, uh, associated with this um, pandemic. And I would say that that's my experience with our patients, but it's probably affecting their day to day activities. With regards to long term effects, a lot of our patients are complaining of fatigue, um, long term fatigue after recovery from COVID. Again, not very clear. Um, um, I think a follow up for this patient is very informative. So that's a very good point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. So we have time for questions, a couple of minutes for questions from the audience. I don't know if anyone wants to, to ask a question. I know there's also some that have been posed in the, the chat. There's there's several in the chat. I might just pull out, there, the first one came from Nicole Rogers, who's um, one of our Atlantic Fellows for Equity and Brain Health, just going in the order. Nicole, did you want to chime in with your question? Sure, unfortunately I'm at work, so you may hear something in the background, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, actually I, I, I asked my question directly to, to the doctor. We, um, I was just curious whether this, about his talk of uh, this antibodies in CSF, in the patients with COVID, and I was wondering whether they had studied patients that had already been vaccinated uh, here in Chile, we, we, we've had like a fast vaccination rate. Uh, so we've started seeing um, a lot of neurovascular events as well as Guillain-Barré uh, and others, which not necessarily are, are th there's no causality like uh, proved, but it, it, it is noticeable that the only risk factor these young people have is the vaccination one day before or two days before. Here we have two two kinds of vaccines. We have the Pfizer, which is mRNA, and the Chinese one, which is I think attenuated virus. So I was just curious whether they had had some sort of experience with neurological manifestations in patients that have been vaccinated. And, and yeah, that that was my question. Thank you. Yeah, and I can say, you know, knock on wood, there haven't been, you know, uh, big reports in the U.S. with the mRNA, and now, um, you know, increasingly it'll be also the J and J uh, vaccine with with uh, of neurologic complications. So we are starting to collect samples from patients um, who are getting vaccinated, mainly to, um, that Riley Beauvais has been leading this work um, to look at just immune responses in our uh, patients who are on immunotherapy, immunosuppressive therapies, just to see how they respond to the vaccine. But we haven't gotten uh, samples yet uh, from 
patients who where there's a suspected neurologic complication from the vaccine. So, um, yeah. I think we're just at time. Uh, so uh, there's many more uh, topics that we could cover. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time to cover all of them. Thank you all for the great questions. And I'd like to send a special thanks to our speakers for uh, first the, the work that you do, and also uh, taking time to uh, share your knowledge and experience with us today. Uh, very much appreciate it. And I'll turn it over to Camelia for some final closing remarks. Hey, thank you, John. Um, so everyone, we recognize that there are so many questions in the chat that unfortunately we didn't get to in our hour. What we're going to try to do is note them down, bring them to our set of speakers and try to get some email replies back out to the participants in this session. Um, that is our hope, so more to come. Um, you'll see I've just shared a survey link in the chat. We would appreciate your feedback about this session. And finally, just another round of thank yous um, to our speakers, everyone, and as well to John and Riley from the Global Teleneurology Service at UCSF for organizing this session. Um, so thank you once again, uh, Michael, Aya, Mashina, Tuwange. We very much value your perspectives. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day and evening. Thank you for having us.